Well, greetings. This morning, I'd like to take us back to Matthew chapter 7, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And as I said a couple of weeks ago, uh, I kind of see the Sermon on the Mount as uh, what I call the constitution of the Christian faith. With only two exceptions, everything that was written by the New Testament writers is rooted in the kingdom principles that Jesus taught when he was here on earth. And the Sermon on the Mount is a um, substantial composite of all of Jesus' teachings. Now, his parables, which are separate, and it, uh, they amount to about a third of his public uh, teaching, those are stories that um, teach us how to apply kingdom principles in our lives in, in a practical way. So they're very spiritual. They teach us. Uh, but there would be like sort of a, a sermon illustration that we would have in uh, the 21st century. But as we discussed as we began this series, this whole chapter 7 of Matthew, this last uh, chapter uh, of the Sermon on the Mount, it's all dedicated to uh, the process uh, of judging, the, the topic of Christ followers uh, judging uh, issues and uh, people in life. Now, Jesus told us that we were not to judge the person, people per se, that's God's rule, but we are to judge their words and their deeds. And then he goes on to teach us the standard by which we judge their words and deeds, and that is God's truth. We judge ourselves and others based on the scriptures. Does a person's actions, uh, their words, what they're teaching, what they profess, does it comply with God's truth or not? Is it rooted in scripture or not? You know, as sovereign creator and ruler of all that there is, God's truth, these principles of life by which uh, they, they are the, the rules or principles by which uh, his creation is to be governed. And um, the New Testament calls these uh, principles uh, the faith, that's a noun, or Paul uses the term sound doctrine. We'll see that in one of the, uh, in, in, in the passage of Timothy that I asked you to read. And the interesting thing, or the important thing, more than interesting, the important thing is that God attaches uh, rewards and or punishments for compliance or disobedience to these principles. In other words, it really matters to God whether people obey or disobey his word. So that's what Jesus is teaching about in this chapter 7 of Matthew, how to judge whether people uh, are, are obeying or disobeying uh, his truth, the scriptures. And again, because there are uh, rewards. Uh, the Bible calls them blessings. We would call, use that term blessings. To be gained by obedience to these principles. And, or, there are punishments. Um, the Bible uses the word wrath that is poured out for disobedience. Now, the word wrath um, and punishment uh, is only poured out on unbelievers. Um, God never pours his wrath out on believers, his children, because Jesus bore God's wrath on the cross. So Christians that uh, do not uh, consistently um, live according to Scripture will feel God's discipline. And quite frankly, I can tell you, I don't know the distinction um, in terms of practical reality because you don't want to feel God's wrath, nor do you want to feel uh, his discipline. Um, uh, one of the verses that always has uh, gotten my attention is in chapter 4 of um, Exodus when Moses was giving God all these excuses why he couldn't go uh, to Egypt to represent uh, God in getting the people, the Hebrew people out of Egypt. And uh, 
the Bible says that the wrath of God or the anger of God, which is another word for wrath, uh, kindled against Moses. I thought this guy's in big trouble. <laughs> anyway, uh, in verses 15 through 20 of chapter 7, uh, Jesus warns believers, Christ followers, about false prophets, false teachers. The word prophet there is translated teacher. They're not telling the future. They're proclaiming uh, some uh, truth. Uh, but in the case of false teachers, they're not proclaiming God's truth. Um, in verses 21 through 23 that we've read uh, pretty much every uh, message for the last three weeks, Jesus is warning about the consequences of uh, following these false teachers, doing what they do, and uh, repeating what they teach. But this morning, for a moment, I want to focus first on uh, what Jesus warns us about with these false teachers in verse 15 of chapter 7. Matthew says, um, puts it this way, Jesus said, watch out for the false teachers. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. So obviously the first thing we want to note about these uh, false teachers is their obvious intent to deceive others, us. Their appearance as sheep is not accidental. It's intentional. Jesus says they come as uh, in the innocence, the gentle uh, manner or temperament of a sheep. Because we know that sheep are perhaps some of the most gentle and uh, vulnerable animals uh, on earth. Uh, they can wander uh, innocently into trouble uh, without even realizing it, uh, they need someone to protect them all the time. But then Jesus con contrasts this gentle uh, uh, sheep uh, appearance uh, with what they're really like, who th what their nature is, and he calls them ferocious wolves. So they're pretending to be innocent as sheep, to get access to the flock, that would be uh, Christians, the church specifically, or the church in general. But their true nature is to do harm and to abuse uh, the flock, God's children. Well, here's a good rule to go by in order to heed Jesus' warning that we see here in verse 15. This is uh, a practical way when he says, watch out. Here's how the Bible teaches us to watch out. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 21. The Bible says, test, another word for judge, everything. Hmm? Everything. Hold on to what is good and avoid every kind of evil. Those words are pretty inclusive. Judge everything. Always be thinking. Always evaluate. Does this bring honor to go and glory to God? Is this a biblical way of dealing with whatever you're thinking about or dealing with? John, in his first letter to the church at Ephesus, 1 John 4, 1, uh, says this, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test. In other words, judge the spirits to see whether they are from God. Because many false teachers have gone out into the world. So when we come to verse 16 of chapter 7, Jesus goes on after warning us about false teachers. He says, by their fruit, you will recognize them. So here we are back at judging people's words and deeds, their fruit, how they live their lives, what they say, how they respond and act to people. It's a constant process that we must be alert at all times. Judge everything, Paul says. We have to think. Christianity is not just blind faith. It's, uh, it takes uh, time, effort, work, and uh, cognitive uh, uh, agility. Think. Pay attention. Uh, what we're judging is uh, what do people promote? 
Um, where do they put their time and money and energy? Uh, who do they give money to? And uh, who do they promote? Are they teaching the obedience to God's word, the Christian faith, or something else? Uh, do they bring unity and fellowship, which are biblical characteristics? Or do they bring division and strife? Do they seek to build God's kingdom, or are they seeking to build their uh, well-being, their financial well-being, their organizational well-being, not the kingdom of God? And Jesus gives us some sobering words in verse 19 of that chapter. He says, Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown in the fire. Now, in the ancient Hebrew language, and it may be true in Hebrew today, um, but the word fire, or the symbol of fire, means total destruction, being consumed. It's very consistent with what Jesus says in John's Gospel, chapter 15. Remember, it begins in verse 1 with, I'm the vine, you, speaking of believers, are the branches. My Father, God, is the vine dresser. And in verse 6, he says in that whole passage where he's teaching his disciples, he says, if anyone does not remain in me, you've got to remain in the vine in order to get nutrients to, to produce, to have any hope of producing fruit. So he says, if you don't re remain in me, he or she is like a branch that is cut off and thrown away and withers. And such branches are gathered up and thrown in the fire and burned. So Jesus is teaching about false teachers and what their uh, end uh, will be. He goes on in that passage we've read each week, verses 21 through 23, and he talks about the consequences of uh, being a false teacher or following a false teacher, repeating or supporting a false teacher. Total destruction, he says, depart from me, you evildoer. I never knew you. Separation from God for all of eternity. And that's why I'm concerned about what our denomination is going through and our congregation, the decisions our congregation are facing right now. How we respond to this, uh, these issues matters to God. We can sustain and um, receive his blessings, or we could incur his discipline based on our response. You see, life has changed. People have changed. Our leadership has changed. And what they're espousing and supporting at this point is not biblical, is not where we started as a denomination. And so it is painful and hurtful, but we must make a choice to say, we've argued about this for 40 years. It's time for us to separate. Because you're not changing, and the Word of God hasn't changed, you're going the wrong direction, and we ain't going with you. <laughs> it's that simple. Well, there's a passage in Ephesians where God speaks to us through the Apostle Paul, and I want to read this to you because it shows the seriousness of these issues. Paul writes, But among you there must not even be the hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity, or of greed, because <clears throat> these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be any obscenity, foolish talk, or even coarse joking, which are out of place. Rather, thanksgiving. For of this you may be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, <clears throat> and then Paul inserts a parentheses here, such a person is an idolater. Anything that comes before our relationship with God on his terms is considered idolatry in God. So he says such a person is an idolater. Not anyone who is immoral, impure, or greedy is going to have any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ <clears throat> and of God. And he goes on and ends that section by saying, and let no one deceive you with 
empty words. Because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. If God's wrath is coming, then they are definitely not believers because God doesn't pour his wrath out. So it's not believers who are being disobedient. There are people who are unbelievers who are disobeying God's word. But they may be in the church because it, based on what Jesus is saying in chapter 7 here, verse 21 through 23, they come into the church appearing as sheep. They're really ferocious wolves. His last line is the key phrase. Therefore, because this is all true and God's wrath is poured out on them, do not partner with them. That is God speaking to us, giving us clear direction. So I'm going to let God's word speak for itself at this point. I don't think God could be any clearer about how we are to respond uh, to the changes of our leadership in our denomination and how uh, we have to uh, respond in terms of judging <clears throat> whether what they are teaching and leading is of the Bible or not. <clears throat> so I want to go over to the second text that you see listed for the video. I've tried to get there for the last two weeks and I run out of time. Um, second Timothy and uh, you can read verses 1 through 5, but I want to make a special uh, <coughs> comment on uh, verses 3 and 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. <clears throat> now, it's interesting that this is some of Paul's last words ever written. He's in a Roman prison as he writes this, and he's not getting out. He gets executed by the emperor Nero. <clears throat> he says to Timothy, who he's writing to, For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. There's that word that he uses for the faith. The, t the composite teaching of the New Testament, the gospel, um, the truth of God. They won't put up with it. He said, instead, they, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them, a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears wants to hear or want to hear. He's referring to false teachers. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myth, falseness. <clears throat> so I want to point out to you the uh, active verb phrases that Paul uses there because it describes what people will do uh, in end times. It describes what people are doing right now. <clears throat> they will not put up with sound doctrine. Again, that's Paul's term for uh, God's truth, the scriptures. They will gather around them a great number, not a few, a great number of teachers, preachers, to say what their itching ears want to hear. And they will turn away from the truth and turn aside to myths, to false belief, false teachings. And that sounds terribly much like what's going on in uh, some areas of Christianity and unfortunately uh, a large area of our denomination today. <clears throat> so let me describe for you uh, what the results of these behaviors are. The, the, this, these are the things that flow uh, from a, in a practical sense, from what these people are doing. One, they are going to decide what is true. Not God's word or not God and his word. They're going to decide what is true or not. Secondly, they will decide what they want to hear from preachers. Third, they will find those that will give them what they want. They're, they, in essence, are saying, make me feel good. Don't step on my toes. Don't don't challenge me. Don't tell me not to do this or whatever. I want to live the way I want to live, and I want God's blessing for it. Ain't going to happen. It just does not happen. You see, false teachers, false prophets or false teachers, cannot exist without false followers. They need people to partner with them. That's why Paul says, don't partner with them. They need people to buy into this false teaching because what it does, it validates their message. 
They say, in effect, look at all the people who are following me. I can't be wrong. Oh, yes, you can. If you deviate from Scripture, I don't care how many are following you. It's still wrong. So to live according to sound doctrine, God's truth, as we said last week, is, is not easy. Living in a way that brings honor and glory to God and living a holy life before God is not a cakewalk. It takes constant work and discipline and perseverance. It's hard. People want an easy fix today. We want no responsibilities, no obligations, no commitments, just blessings. And that's not how Christianity works. That's not how God works. They want a benign God with a small g who just blesses everything that they want to do. And yet G James, who was Jesus' half-brother, when he wrote his book in the New Testament, he says, count it all joy when you face trials and tribulations. Why? Because perseverance during difficult times builds your faith. It builds your Christian character. It strengthens your faith. It's a positive thing. Don't avoid it. Jesus says in his Sermon on the Mount, back in Matthew 7 there, that narrow is the gate and difficult is the road that leads to paradise. And only a few choose to go that way. Because it is hard work. It takes effort. Discipline. He said, wide is the gate and very pleasing is the road that leads to destruction. And many choose to go that way. Jesus is saying they follow the wrong crowd. It's like a super highway, smooth as silk, but it leads to destruction. So my comment is that I chose the hard road because it's only a short time, the time of a human life, but it leads to paradise, being in glory with, in heaven we call it. And that's for eternity. So the question is, what is your choice? Are you going to take God's word and follow it? Or are you going to follow false words, empty words? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your love for us that you have given us instruction how to live a life in a way that uh, uh, you can bless that we're part of your family and that we spend eternity with you and not separated from you thank you for these truths and i pray father that the holy spirit would apply them uh, to our hearts and minds and change the way we think and the way we live in jesus name amen have a good week